afternoon everyone welcome to one more session of clinician scientist interactive session uh, today it's about pcr the second talk is by dr divya who would introduce to a concept called bedside pcr before that i'll just tell you about the basics of pcr and the types of uh, uh, different instruments that we have now uh, what is pcr pcr is the technique that results in the exponential amplification of a desired region of a DNA molecule in vitro. Now, uh, why? Why do we need PCR? It is to generate millions of copies of a particular section of DNA from a very small original amount. I would draw your attention to very small original amount. So that's the reason, because there's a limitation on the amount of DNA that is available. We need to amplify it so that we can do the downstream analysis of that particular stretch of DNA. Say for example, to detect various infectious organisms or to detect variants in DNA, these are one of the very few uh, reasons that we amplify it and then uh, do the uh, downstream process. Of course, it was invented by Carrie Mullis, which was a revolution, I should, I should say, because molecular biology has changed after this particular invention. Uh, I, it, it's very difficult to imagine a particular protocol without doing a PCR first, more so in genomics-based uh, work. He was a scientist at CITES and it was uh, uh, discovered, uh, invented in 1983 and he received the 1993 Nobel Prize for this particular discovery in uh, chemistry. Now the basic principle is you have a template of DNA which you wish to amplify and it from one particular template, you get two templates and so on. The cycle goes on. So it exponentially amplifies during each cycle. And that's the way, we, that's the reason we do a PCR as well. Uh, uh, why the name PCR is because we use an enzyme in the reaction, which is called as DNA polymerase, which actually faithfully replicates the template DNA and the product of the first reaction actually forms the template during subsequent reactions. That's the reason we call it a chain. So it is called as polymerase after the DNA polymerase and the chain because there's a chain which forms the template during the subsequent. So it's called polymerase chain reaction. Now, if you actually see what happens during a PCR, it is what the same happens during the DNA replication. What happens during DNA replication is there's an enzyme called helicase which unwinds the DNA and there's a RNA primase enzyme which introduces a primer that binds to the single-stranded DNA. That's because DNA cannot replicate if it is not double-stranded. So what this RNA primase does is it introduces a RNA primer so that it can become a double helix. And then of course the DNA polymerase binds to this double helix and start synthesizing the newly new strand. This is from the five prime to three prime direction only. The same happens during PCR also, but we incubate the sample at different temperatures. Now, denaturation, whatever helicase does, we usually heat the DNA template so that the double helix comes apart. That is usually done at 95 to 98 degrees centigrade which is typically for around five minutes on the initial cycle and subsequently for 30 seconds to one minute, depending on the requirement. But heating the DNA template at 98 degrees, actually you are denaturing the template. And subsequently, of course, the region which you wish to amplify, you design your primers specific to that particular region and those primers bind to the template of the DNA which is at a very specific temperature called as the annealing temperature, which depends on the GC content of the primer and the melt temperature of the total primers as such. So at a particular very specific temperature, this particular sequence that you have designed actually goes and binds to the template DNA. And of course the polymerase is also added during the PCR reaction, so it binds. You have a template, you have a primer that you have designed, both of the two which your DNA polymerase binds and of course you supply the uh, DNTPs and the chain elongation happens. This is typically what happens during a PCR. Extension of course of the DNA polymerase that 
extends the template, happens at around 68 to 72 degrees centigrade, and subsequently the final extension happens, which is again at 72 degrees centigrade. So this is the typical programming that you employ to amplify a template that wish you wish to amplify. Now, the main aspect of the PCR is primer designing. So here, say for example, the dotted lines is the region that you wish to amplify. So you design your primers upstream of this particular sequence and downstream of this particular sequence, both on the forward and the reverse strand. Of course, you have uh, 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 very good softwares that you give the template to that particular software. There are a lot of other rules which I'm not going into, but you have a specific set of rules that your primer sequence has to be, which is taken care by the software. So if you give your template for which you intend to design a primer, the software designs the primers upstream of the uh, region that needs to be amplified and downstream that needs to be amplified. Of course, this is something called as a forward primer and a reverse primer. So essentially what you are adding to a PCR mix is a forward primer, a reverse primer, the template that you wish to amplify, a DNA polymerase and DNTPs. Of course, these are the minimum requirements for you to do a PCR reaction. Now, once you have amplified your template, the typical way that you check whether you have amplified it correctly or not is something called as a agarose gel electrophoresis. Agarose is nothing but a sieve kind of a thing. So, uh, the uh, larger fragments have, it, they take time to go through this particular sieve, while the smaller fragments, they pass through the sieve very easily. Now, the background to this is, DNA has a negative charge to it. So when you apply current to DNA, it runs towards the positive side. Now, how do you visualize DNA? It is by adding something called as ethidium bromide, which goes and binds to the double-stranded DNA in the minor group, and it fluoresces. So you visualize your template using a UV light. So here, you are doing the electrophoresis using, using something called as agarose and you are using ethidium bromide to it. Now, this was typically the way that you used to amplify and do a agarose gel el electrophoresis. Subsequently, we have now done away with the agarose gel electrophoresis by using, by adding some kind of a fluorescence to the product itself. And then the later two, that is the real-time PCR and of course the digital droplet PCR are the advancements to the standalone PCR where you need not do a gel electrophoresis. The, uh, you have done away with the gel electrophoresis. You add some kind of a fluorescence to the PCR product itself. And while the product is being ampli amplified, you visualize that particular product. Now, how do you do that? Typically, the real-time PCR employs something called as a cyber green, which typically binds to a double-stranded DNA. So, if as the product is being amplified, more the template, more is the cyber green that goes and binds to the double-stranded DNA, and more is the fluorescence. So, if you have a lesser initial template, the time it takes to amplify will be more, as against more is the initial template, more of cyber green is added during the subsequent cycles, thereby there is more of fluorescence. So as the PCR is being done, you actually acquire the fluorescence and see whether a particular template is being amplified or not. The flip side to cyber green is, it binds to any template that is double stranded. So there is a chance of non-specific amplification. To overcome that, they have introduced something called as a Tackman probe, where a specific sequence actually binds to the template, which is again labeled with a particular kind of a fluorescence. Now, this specifically goes, goes and binds to the template, and it doesn't go and bind to any non-specific template. So that's the way you are getting specificity to this particular Tackman probe. Of course, both of them are done on the real-time PCR, or typically called as a qPCR. Now, CT value is one of the important aspect of any real-time PCR. So while you are actually doing the PCR amplification, so you have an initial uh, phase where the template is being amplified and the fluorescence from that particular template doesn't come out of the background noise. That is, you have a lot of background cyber green or a Tackman based fluorescence and the amplification doesn't overcome that. Now, typically after a few cycles, what happens is the specific template that you are amplifying, the fluorescence comes from that particular template 
and it comes out of the background noise. Now, at what cycle this uh, uh, fluorescence comes out of the background noise, that cycle is referred to as the TT or a CQ uh, uh, value. Now, this is typically again, more is the initial template, early is the amplification that comes out of the background noise, less is the initial template. It will take more cycles for the uh, fluorescence to come out of the background noise. So, CT value is absolutely the value that you typically use to interpret the, uh, uh, the uh, real time PCR results. Now, of course, you have while doing gene expression on real time, you have something called as absolute gene expression and a relative gene expression. Absolute gene expression is you are quantifying the gene expression in absolute number. Very simply put, what you do is you, uh, you do the amplification using some kind of a standard where you know the concentration of that particular standard and do, you do a serial dilution. So you know the concentration of the standard and you will check the CT value that is the amplification of that particular standard at what CT cycle it is coming. So you run a unknown uh, sample also along with the known standard and the CT value is compared to the CT value of the known concentration which is the part of the standard. Relative gene expression of course is you are comparing the expression of say for example a tumor relative to the expression of the control. So in a cancer setting, I do not wish to know whether a particular gene is what is the actual value of that expression. My only interest is whether it is overexpressed or underexpressed in a tumor. So relative to the control, how is the expression of a particular gene? You do something called as a relative gene expression. So you isolate, of course, the RNA, cDNA, and then you generate the CT values and you compare the CT value of the uh, gene that you wish to identify to a reference standard gene and of course the CT value of the tumor to the control. These are all basically the numbers and 2 power minus of delta delta CT gives you the fold change. This is basically a simple math that you do getting the CT values by running it on a real time PCR. Now the latest advancement of course last week we had an excellent talk on the digital droplet PCR. So this is the other advancement that is actually revolutionizing the way that we look at more so in the oncology segment because there are these rarer uh, variants using this particular thing. So the entire experimental setup is the same, but for you are actually compartmentalizing the entire sample into this small, uh, uh, this thing, so that the individual reaction actually detects the variant with a frequency of less than 0.01% in the template that you wish to amplify. So this is the latest advancement that has been there. Of course, with respect to the met methodology, there are almost a lot of PCRs depending on the requirement Say for example, the inverse PCR, multiplex PCR, depending on the template that you wish to amplify, you use different kinds of modified PCR te uh, technologies. Now the limitations is, of course, the size that you amplify, you have a limited range. You cannot, of course, amplify the entire human genomic region. A part of the genome, anywhere between 700 to probably around 2 KB fragments can be amplified. Anything beyond that is a uh, issue. Contamination, uh, of course, is the devil which we cannot see, so that we will have to live with that. So, you will have to be absolutely careful when you are doing a PCR, but contamination is one of the issues with PCR. Then prior information sequence is required. As you have to design the primers, you should know the template sequence that you wish to amplify. And then uh, non-specific amplification is of course one issue that there are other ways to overcome it. but. Usually, there is non-specific amplification issue. Although very rare, the incorrect nucleotides are incorporated while the PCR because the polymerase that we use in a normal PCR does not have the proof reading activity. That is, any wrongly incorporated nucleotide, the polymerase does not correct it. Fortunately, in humans and the other uh, animals, so the DNA polymerase has a proof reading activity. So, any wrong nucleotide is incorporated, it identifies and corrects that nucleotide. In vivo, in vitro, we do not have that. And the inhibitors, of course, the heme, you isolate the DNA. If there is any contamination in the DNA that you have isolated, that carries over to the PCR setup and then, of course, it inhibits the PCR amplification. And then you cannot amplify RNA. So, you will have to convert it into cDNA and then amplify that particular cDNA. 
and amplifying GC rich region in the template of uh, the DNA, it, it has its own, its own issues. So we'll have to add additional uh, uh, ingredients like DMSO or some other ingredient to amplify the GC rich region. So not all part of the human genome or any templates can be amplified very easily. So we'll have to actually make a lot of modifications depending on the template that you are looking at. With this, I hand it over to Dr. Divya and thank you. Hello everyone, uh, good afternoon. This is Dr. Divya. Um, I have done my PhD from CSIR CC. I uh, went on to do a post postdoc at uh, Johns Hopkins University Medicine in TB. And then uh, I'm uh, a scientist who's on an entrepreneurial journey. Uh, today, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Shashikala, Dr. G. Rao for having invited me for this clinician and scientist interact interaction session, which is a great uh, privilege for me to be here interacting with all of you who are doing real impact in this world. Uh, when I started my journey, both as a scientist and now as an entrepreneur, one of the first things that I was focusing on is impact. I have one life. How can I uh, do something that is impactful? And I know all of you are already in the practice of doing that. And that is why I'm here to learn from all of you, collaborate, and actually bridge the gap between academic science and translation uh, so that it can be practically uh, applied where all you doctors, clinicians are uh, actually practicing. So let me start with uh, an overview. I think both scientists as well as doctors have these uh, a process to do the work. There's, of course, a scientific method. There's also a doctrine of how to carry about, uh, you know, diagnosis, etc. cetera. Um, so the three uh, words are always impact me a lot. Insight, which is basically if there's a particular problem for a scientist, you first want to know everything about it. You get that insight and, and then think about how we can innovate and how we can solve that problem and then design the experiments accordingly. For a doctor, the insight is actually getting to know more about the patient or the problem in hand and then seeing how can that be treated and coming with those insights from their knowledge and practice. The second is impact. Impact is actual work that is being done, the experiment that the scientist does in the lab or the doctor uh, you know, carrying out the treatment procedure or the surgery that is there. The final one is introspection. Like Once we are done with it, uh, how is that being helpful for the next patient for the, from the doctor's perspective or learnings from that and for the scientist learn those and take it up forward for the next experiment. This was especially important uh, because this the, my entire life journey has also been very similar to these three lines. So to give a bit of background, uh, when I did my scientist journey, I was initially thinking about becoming a cancer researcher, which is why I had started my PhD in cancer biology and delved deeper into understanding cell signaling, cell biology, uh, and you know carrying out research uh, with. Uh, you know, brain tumor, uh, tissues, trying to understand the signaling pathways that are involved in that uh, particular, or even uh, EMT, epithelial to mesenchymal transition, what are the molecular pathways, how we can impact that, and how to solve the problem of cancer. But during this journey, a lot of uh, personal experiences uh, led me into understanding the gaps in infectious uh, biology, or especially, I can say, infectious diagnostics. And we realized that we require to use all these technologies like PCRs and RT-PCRs that uh, Dr. Ravikant has very nicely uh, explained before me and has really set the stage for my talk here, uh, so thanks to him, uh, is that all these technologies are available to us scientists. We do it almost on an everyday basis. And when COVID had hit, it just hit uh, my mind also that all of these technologies are there only in our laboratories. It is not getting translated to the patient. It is not getting translated to the common people. 
uh, and uh, and the same thing when I had my personal experiences, I can tell you a little bit like I lost someone very close to me just because they were misdiagnosed or they were not being able to diagnose in time. And I thought this is not a problem just for the underprivileged, but it's also a problem, real problem for the privileged because of the increasing antimicrobial resistance, because of the increasing number of pathogens and types of pathogens and diseases that are coming across every day. And the world is just becoming smaller and smaller. A disease that starts off, in, and we can we have seen that with COVID, a disease that starts off in one part of the world can very quickly spread to other. So having said that, then during my PhD, I made a decision that this is, uh, I'm going to take the journey forward into looking into how I can translate this PCRs, RT-PCRs, which are great diagnostic tools for accurate diagnosis of infectious diseases in the field and started doing all side research projects on this uh, end. And also I was fortunate enough to get a chance to go at Hopkins and do a bit more uh, research on that. Um, so then what did we, to, or what did I learn when I went into this journey? The first thing that I realized, the gap that is there, uh, is rapid diagnostics is required. And uh, where is the rapid diagnostics required, right? One, which are infections that are time critical. Or if you have neonatal sepsis cases or other cases where we don't have proper screening tools or we have screening tools, but unfortunately due to the science, they just can only detect infection after a certain stage of the infection where it can become too late. There are a lot of standard pathological and microbiological technologies that have really that are really helping us every day. And thanks to those pathologists who have those experiences that they can look at something and say that this is wrong. But in certain cases, it is not just possible to even look. There's nothing there, but there is still an infection because it's just we just don't have something sensitive enough to look faster. And that is where I realized this rapid diagnostics is required. ICU cases, emergent cases, and I'm sure you, I, I would love to hear from all of you what you think are those rapid, uh, all those cases where the rapid diagnostics is required, then and there where you don't have time to wait for a line for diagnostics and carry out. The second reason why we require also rapid diagnostics is sample limitation. Uh, most of the times, diagnostics that take a long time or uh, are with traditional technologies require a large amount of sample from the patient, and that is not possible in many cases, especially when uh, looking at infections with neonates, etc. Or the sample is just rare, or some biopsy that has been taken from somewhere, and it's just not possible to go back and you know, surgically remove that. The, th the third part is resource limitation, right? A lot of, uh, we are here at tier one cities, but we talk about tier three or primary healthcare centers in other places. The resources are just not there. I had some opportunity to talk to doctors at Ames who actually go to tribal areas to, to you know, give people, uh, you know, consultation and treatment. But they also said the major issue is we don't have a diagnostic tool. So even if somebody we find is some a candidate that they can, think of treating them for something. They just don't know which disease it is. Because a lot of the diseases, that's why we come to the second point, a lot of the diseases have very overlapping symptoms. So differential diagnosis becomes very difficult, especially in infectious disease. If we think about respiratory infections, all of them look like a cold or a common cold. And I think one of the things, again, I'm bringing COVID because it has really created a huge impact in our lives. And the journey also for me, I realized a lot of the people want a tool to screen in large populations, say for in pandemics, or say if you want to restrict people from coming in into hospitals who have uh, symptoms or who may be carriers uh, of certain infectious diseases, there's just no way to screen them very fast. And there are multiple screening tools like rapid antigen tests, etc. But again, unfortunately, the science is such for those tests that only after the disease reaches a level that the symptom is already exhibited, you cannot actually do, uh, carry out the disease. The other diseases with overlapping symptoms, we have, I, I was able to look at it because I was coming here and I know that uh, I'm also very interested in these diseases, is we see Peritoneal tuberculosis versus carcinomatosis uh, have very similar overlapping symptoms. Crohn's disease and intestinal tuberculosis have overlapping symptoms. And how do we differentially diagnose uh, in situations where it can be done faster and at the point of care? The third thing that where differential diagnosis is very important is antimicrobial resistance. 
uh, or identifying the specific strains. So what we typically know, like for TB, I can tell you there are multiple uh, different types of uh, strains which are resistant. Um, and then we need to identify, the doctor needs to know which of these strains are these in order to uh, figure out the treatment option. And that is the case uh, in many other things. Uh, in pneumonia, MRSA strain, you need to know if it's methicillin resistant or not. B based on that, the antibiotic courses and other things are different. Um, so with these scenarios, the main need of the hour in clinical diagnostics uh, that we learned was that there sh we need something that can be both accurate as well as point of care. And that is what we don't have. And what we did, so having that insight, we've developed a technology called DLAMP, which is Denome's highly accurate nucleic acid amplification technology. In short, PCR that can be carried out in ambient temperatures. So this technology, and I would love to dive a bit deeper because I understand that uh, there are a lot of uh, scientists here as well and clinicians who are interested in knowing what exactly is this technology. Is uh, Dr. Ravikant had told us about uh, what is polymerase chain reaction. So and there are different types of PCRs that are available today. So I'm here to talk about one type of PCR, which is called isothermal PCR or PCR that can be carried out at the same temperature or singular temperature. Now, why is that important? It's important because today PCR uh, machines that are carrying out and uh, where Dr. Ravikant was telling us different temperatures like 98 degrees, 55 degrees and other, the cycle of that happening where each cycle you have amplification happening where one product becomes the substrate of the second reaction and so on. That particular cycle uh, needs to be done by the machine. So there's a high dependence on a machine that can take you to high temperatures in a very short amount of time and then bring it down uh, you know, in a very short amount of time and that too they have to keep doing that for 30 cycles or so which is why it takes two hours or two and a half hours to complete the entire reactions. Now, uh, in isothermal PCR, the idea is to use polymerase, which is the enzyme which actually does the amplification of DNA, uh, use a polymerase that can work uh, without, does not require the cycling and can just work in the same temperature. Now, there are multiple, uh, there are two basic enzymes today that is available for people to use in isothermal amplification. One enzyme that works at 65 degrees and another enzyme that works at 45 degrees. This enzyme that works at 45 degrees right now is not commercially available because of certain constraints in the production of that enzyme. So there's only one technique actually that is available which is at 65 degrees but it also has a lot of issues which is this is the technology that i had started working on when i was starting my side projects and realized that this has a great potential to come into point of care diagnostics because it can amplify just like a pcr does not require all the heating things that the current pcrs need so therefore it can be miniaturized in small uh, but it has problems in terms of false positives and spurious amplifications. What it means is sometimes uh, it can get contaminated very easily with previous reactions and can give out a lot of false positive results, which is not desirable. And that is the reason that people, for last 20 years, people have not been able to bring this technology into practice. Um, the second uh, reason you also require these large machines is detection. A lot of the detection like uh, Dr. Ravikant was talking about is uh, based on fluorescence based detection that requires complex detectors in this fluorescent dyes and other things which are very expensive uh, and uh, it makes the entire process also requiring such very specific environments. So therefore, you cannot take a PCR machine to the point of care and carry out. You cannot miniaturize those uh, devices uh, very easily. So then came the next level of uh, devices. So what we have done, so what we have been able to carry out is we have a polymerase that essentially works at ambient temperatures between 30 and 45 degrees. And if you remember, Dr. Ramikan talked about a helicase that basically goes and uh, opens up the DNA for the actual reaction to take place. So I can take, take you through the actual IP, what we have created. So we have five components in our reaction, which is called D-LAMP reaction, where 
one of the components is the main component called the polymerase that actually opens up the helicase without requiring high temperature so normal helicases require high temperatures to activate but we do not require those high temperatures we can do it at 30 to 45 now second the other four components help in creating this entire PCR reaction without with a proper feedback loop mechanism that tells you that if there is an amplification happening to X level, it will stop at X level and not create false positive results, which is a major issue with today's isothermal PCRs. And that is one of the bigger innovations that we have in our technology. The other components, like we talked about uh, problems and contaminants in PCR, because PCR, uh, when you talk about contaminants, we all think about you know, dirty things like, you know, uh, which are there in the environment. But in molecular biology, the contaminant can be just human DNA. If you take a human tissue and we're looking at bacterial DNA, the major contaminant is human DNA, which is 99.99% in the sample. And you have 0.001% of your bacterial DNA or whatever, pathogenic DNA. So this, uh, how do you take care of multiple types of contaminants? Sometimes you have blood as a tissue, sometimes you have urine as a tissue, and you know you have uh, different types of tissues, basically, from where you will have to look for infectious disease detection. And these all tissues will come with their own pH, own different types of chemical environments, which will get translated when we are isolating the DNA. And that will affect the polymerase chain reaction. So we have the other two or three components which are there in the part of our IP that actually combats these components and gives more resistance to their interference in the reaction, which makes our technique highly accurate. So that is, so to, to give you a brief on how it basically works, if you see the diagram here, we ha there is a device on the right, which is a prototype. This is just a prototype we have built. The idea is we want feedback on the prototype from all of you also. Uh, how it works is have the tissue from where you co we collect the tissue and we have a one step DNA isolation that can be done in the point of care. Again, you don't require any laboratory equipments or kits to carry out that process. In some cases like swabs or saliva samples, we have seen we can directly add it to our enzyme mix. Now this once the sample, the isolated DNA or the sample goes into our enzyme mix. That mix can then be put into this device. There is a small opening here where we just put a very small amount of this uh, thing, which is why, which is another advantage, very small amount of sample can also be used. And then uh, wait for 30 minutes. In just 30 minutes, there's there going to be a strip in the device like where you see here where you'll see lines just very similar to a lateral flow assay or a rapid antigen test so we've been able to build this chemistry which helps in uh, easy visualization or easy interpretation of the result by anybody so there is no complexity re required or skill required uh, you know compared to what rt pcrs and pcrs uh, output build up so so that it's actually point of care and easy to use the second thing that's very important in diagnostics essays, and we have taken a huge care, is about uh, how did we make sure that this essay is accurate. And as uh, Dr. Ravikant has said, once the PCR is done, there are multiple outputs. Like one is you do gel electrophoresis and see the output. On second is you have fluorescence output to see the amplified results. So with multiple internal uh, technologies like agarose gel electrophoresis and fluorescent assays, we have been able to test it out internally in synthetic samples and then say that, okay, this works, the technology works. Now, in during the technology, there are two, if you look at the technology in general, or PCR in general, there are two major components. One is the enzyme component, which where the polymerase in, uh, comes into play. And the second is the uh, detection component. Or sorry, second is the oligo component, where the uh, specificity comes to which uh, reaction or for which the PCR is being done. So all the scientists know here, like you get a PCR kit from somewhere, all you need to do is design the oligos for whatever application that you're looking for, and then you integrate it with the kit and carry out. Similarly, 
uh, what we've built is a platform technology where we our moat is in the enzymes part. So we design different oligos for different application and club it with our enzyme mix and make different uh, total diagnostic kits. So in the first step in any internal diagnostic validations we do is oligo optimizations. Uh, that itself is a process that requires because requires a lot of rigor because that is the most important part of our specificity or identifying which particular pathogen we are looking at or even which strain of the pathogen we are looking at. We have even come up with oligo designs that can help in point mutation detections, which is a very challenging project and I would love to discuss more in the application part. The second thing what we do is look at analytical specificity and sensitivity. Now, specificity and sensitivity, I don't need to tell all of you, I'm sure you're all aware, but specificity deals with how which organism are we able to detect this organism compared to the similar organisms uh, of that particular species genus etc the second is sensitivity is how low of the organism can you detect can we detect one virus particle one copy number five copy number what is the limit of detection now limit of detection for normal pcrs and rt, -PC RT pcrs at least is between 10 to 100 copies and uh, you know, a good diagnostic assay, uh, which today, like most of the rapid antigen tests or POC diagnostics have LODs which are greater than 100. Uh, what we are also trying to build is an, uh, an assay that is within the 10 to 100 so that it is as accurate as possible. Then comes assay optimization. Assay optimization is we have all the individual components done. Now all together with the sample, how it works. There are multiple things that we do to optimize that, to see the temperature, to see the environment where it is being done, how it is being used, etc. Then comes the second is clinical validations. Internal validations are great, but what's important is actually validating in clinical samples, and which is where the other contaminants and other things also come into play. Uh, and benchmark it with the gold standard uh, qPCR or RT-PCR. The idea of benchmarking is that whatever test we do, we also take the same sample and do the qPCR and see what is the CT value that we get there. And we always look at to see what is the limit of CT, like when we cross compare, what is the CT value, what is the largest CT value that we can identify, which speaks to the sensitivity issue here. So as Dr. Ravikant very nicely explained, CT value, the higher the CT value, the lower the amount of pathogen that is there in the sample. So in our assay, we are able to detect CT values of 35 also, which is not something that any rapid antigen test or anything can detect at this point. Only PCRs and RT-PCRs have been able to come to that level. And uh, the third thing what we do is to actually integrate it with the detection modality. So right now we have standardize this with the lateral flow detection, which is the strip detection, where how the strip can identify nucleic acids. So a lot of the strips today identify proteins. They identify different types of proteins, antibodies, etc. And that has been very, sta very standard and standardized assays. Whereas what we are trying to do here is actually detect nucleic acids directly, which is the other challenge or other innovation that part that we are doing at this point. The third, uh, the fourth thing is stability assays and inhibitor assays. Now, we have to imagine in real scenarios, what are the different types of inhibitors that can come? Like whether from the blood, a lot of the components in blood can actually be inhibitory for PCR. A lot of the components from certain tissues will be inhibitory, maybe certain tissues it will not be inhibitory. So all those different individual chemical components we take and then we study and see what is the refractory index of the test? How much of the inhibitor can it take? How much of this contaminant can it take? So those stability assays we do at the end and we also do stability assays for individual enzymes so we have set of five enzymes in our assay each of these enzymes how they are working together uh, what is the buffer composition should we add DMSO more or not all of those uh, optimizations also come into into here and and being able to make it so that it can be scaled up it can be made and in, into something that is stable enough for people to use consistently so uh, I would like to delve a little bit deeper on the accuracy in a diagnostic test, which I feel is the most important uh, discussion we, we are going to have today. 
because um, a lot of the uh, tests and uh, things that are there out today many of them don't work a lot of the times uh, the question comes that uh, there should be some regulations around this and not but many regulatory tests also sometimes fail um, the main reason is from a scientist perspective statistics is a very important thing for all our biologists also in terms of when we are looking at numbers and clinical validations and um, inaccuracy and uh, there are four important terms that uh, you know we need to look at one is uh, of course sensitivity and specificity those two we have already discussed the other ones are npv and ppv negative predictive value and positive predictive value now, all of these sensitivity, specificity, negative predictive value and positive predictive value all come from data that is com coming from a trial or a test that we are doing, a validation we are doing on clinical samples. So, one of the, uh, those, those trials and clinical samples from healthy individuals or sick individuals will give us these four things. True positives, that means the sample was actually positive, that is it has been uh, deemed positive from a standardized test or gold standard already and our test also has given the same result, so it's a true positive. Then comes uh, true negative, that again it was deemed negative with a gold standard test and it has also shown negative in our test. Then comes your false positive where it is supposed to be negative but it has come as positive. And you have false negative, which is supposed to be positive, but has come as negative in our test. Now, we look at the numbers for all of these. And by looking at certain formulas and ratios of true positives and false positives, we come up with product positive predictive value, which basically says is how good is your test in predicting a positive test. And a negative predictive value with the false negative and true negative is how good is your test in predicting the negative uh, results. And this is absolutely important to also note that all of these will depend on what is the percentage of, uh, you know, samples that you're taking from uh, like negative samples and percentage of positive samples or how many healthy patients you're screening versus how many unhealthy patients because that is uh, something that can be skewed in multiple ways and, uh, and given different kinds of numbers. So what we do and as scientists we made sure when we designed everything is whatever the sample number the the ratio of positive to negative patients should always be one is to one or closer to one is to one so that we can have a good power in the diagnostic test and um, and what we have now done is already tested in synthetic samples and, and clinical samples, more clinical samples in COVID because we had access to it because CCMB was a di COVID diagnostic lab at the time and we were working there as uh, volunteers. So uh, we tested in almost uh, 200 uh, patient samples and 300 synthetic samples uh, and got uh, NPV and PPV which is greater than uh, which is between 95 to 98 percent which is very similar to what uh, RT-PCR or QPCR uh, has and we also did synthetic samples and very few clinical samples we were able to get for pneumonia and we did for M bovium all in uh, uh, all in the sam clinical samples uh, and we got again a greater than 95% uh, NPV and PPV, which is to say that we have a sensitivity and specificity uh, between 95 to 98% in our test. And that tells that this is a technology that is coming up as an accurate thing. But again, what we need to do next is actually take all of your help in doing it in larger samples and identifying different other applications where this is actually required because we have built a platform where all the application has to be then decided by our collaborators. So the current collaborations that we are undergoing, uh, one is with Hinduja Hospitals where we are looking to uh, create a panel of tests with our DLAM technology in pneumonia. There are various species that causes pneumonia and there are multiple strains in each of them. So we are targeting that as one of our first uh, pilots and pilots that are going in parallel. The second is uh, basically being part of um, the 
BIRAC uh, group because we got a grant recently and we've been able to successfully complete our missions in the grant. We are part of the National Biopharma Mission Clinical Trial Sites where we have access to large trial sites. And once we do a pilot or a collaborate uh, with doctors, identify where we have to build the technology, we'll build it. And then we, we have the access to go and actually test it in large uh, sites. The third is uh, we are right now in collaboration with another company and uh, Apollo Hospital where we are trying to take up the challenge of detecting KRAS mutations in cancers. Now KRAS mutations uh, have a lot of um, impact on multiple types of cancers including pancreatic and colorectal cancers I'm sure all of you know and there are multiple um, uh, mutations in codon 12 uh, and 13 and this uh, is, uh, is important to know which of these which are the mutations that are being affected in order to go for the treatment options. The one of the challenges that PCRs and RT-PCRs have in oligo design is that point mutations are difficult to detect because um, you know when you have just one difference uh, in in the nucleotide, sometimes you can have non-specific. Uh, amplification happening, and that is a huge problem in as as a uh, in the entire PCR uh, uh, as a this thing. So what we have done is we have again innovated there where we are trying to use our technology but there's also putting innovation on top of that to see how we can reduce those false positives and make that more accurate so for the scientists here uh, look at it as like two lock mechanisms so oligo gives specificity as the one step but uh, we have added other mechanisms which will add the second step so it's like two step verification we have uh, in our phones for multiple things we have two step verification to ensure that we are able to uh, identify one single uh, polymorphism also in the genetic signatures. So uh, having said that, I since this is an interaction, I would love uh, to take questions and also uh, understand from all of you, what are the clinical applications you think that we can uh, work with you and develop, which will be helpful in your uh, career, in your work uh, as such as doctors, as well as scientists who are actually working here um, to help in this particular regard. The second uh, thing I'd also like to say that we would love to collaborate in multiple different ways with all of you to develop new kits as well as validate our existing kits because this point of care disease diagnostics is where the uh, you know field is going ahead and we would love all of you to be part of that journey thank you so much Do you have also mycobacterium tuberculosis? Yeah, that's a great question. So we have designed for mycobacterium tuberculosis, but we are right now working uh, to get samples to test on it because that is a bit of a challenge here. But what we did is when I was at Hopkins, we were able to test a very few number of samples uh, and uh, sort of like a very POC kind at the stage where my tech also was in POC stage. It was not fully made and we were able to again detect it. But we are looking for more samples at this point so that's what we 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 do have a lot of samples here to test you know we have both positive as hmm. well as negative yeah. as the pulmonology department will have the pulmonary samples fluids but uh, what at pcr lab in the my uh, research labs do is the tissue analysis yes the tissue uh, mycobacteria tb versus crohn's disease Right. That's where we do and PCR, but that takes time, you know, we, we do it in batches. But this seems to be very good for point of care. So if it is done in the colonoscopy or endoscopy area itself, within half an hour, that, hmm. that will be very good. So we will be having a lot of samples which are tuberculosis positive as well as negative with us DNA. If we can test that, that would be very good. Thank you so much, Dr. Shashikala. I mean, uh, that helps me a lot. We're also interested in intestinal TB, uh, apart from the pulmonary uh, TB or any other disease. So we would definitely, I'll talk to you about that. I'm just taking notes here. Nice talk. Uh, I have a question. Is your amplification and isolation in the same tube or is it in two different tubes? That's a wonderful question. So what we're doing is uh, the purification part, we are putting a one step 
uh, isolation. So where uh, it's going to look like a contraption, it's going to look like a syringe. All you need to do is just put it in and just press it. And whatever comes out, you can directly put it into our DLAM mix. So that we will supply it along with this so that people can use it there. And your that syringe is the same across different tissue types? Yes, we are trying to make it uh, similar across blood, as well as soft tissues, all kinds of soft tissues. And what's the quality parameter that the lysis is correct? That's a wonderful question. So again, what we do is uh, internally, uh, once the tissue is lysed, apart from PCR, we also look at the quality, uh, the differences in how much percentage DNA, how much percentage protein, how much percentage other contaminants are coming in from the tissue. And we have different tests for each of these parameters and then determine a specific range. So now that we know what are the ranges of our contaminants, we are able to uh, do a much, uh, you can say, uh, way in which we can ca figure out, okay, this percentage is good enough to carry out and then test it out. And if you take it to the bedside, do we need to do all these quality parameters? or No, 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 no. This is, uh, on the end of the user, they don't have to do it. We are already making it and we will say then, these, these, these tissues, it should work. So, and we'll specify how much amount of each tissue has to be used. That's it. There's nothing else that needs to be done. From my this, second so. question is with regard to the Keras mutations. Hmm. Do you multiplex or each yeah. thing is a single? That's a wonderful question. I didn't talk much about multiplexing. So multiplexing, uh, there are two types of multiplexing. One is uh, we have different targets for the same disease. And second type of multiplex is you have different diseases for the same sample. Now, uh, multiplexing in terms of KRAS, uh, yes, we are trying to develop a multiplex uh, PCR, but not in the device format. We are using our own technology, but we are going to devise it into a plate format. So the entire thing, so the reagent itself will be coated on the plate. Uh, different wells will be for different mutations. And then you all you need to do is put the sample in each of these wells. Wait for 30 minutes and you can either see a color change that tells you a positive or a negative. That is one way that we are thinking about in terms. The second is uh, identifying which specific mutations people want. If they don't want to know all the 12, uh, uh, then they can pick up which mutations, like which are the common ones, G12, uh, C, mm -hmm. etc. And then uh, and then have this device equivalent panel where they can do three mutations at one go. That is one. The sure. third is we also have some innovation in genomics side. So because I know a lot of uh, the tests also go for genomics because you want to know what other mutations, if it's just KRAS, if it is an NRAS or some other mutations, we uh, this once you do the plate technique, the same reaction can be then taken for genomics without having to take the sample again from the patient. So that is a second level that we are trying to build. Did you see any false negatives in your study? If so so in, what was the reason for the false negative? Right. So false negatives, we could not identify the reason. Um, it, it's, it could be that the sample variation, so we, because we're taking clinical samples, some sample variation, some contaminant that we were unable to identify and uh, mitigate. Thank you. Thank you. So what's the minimum threshold for the DNA DNA as a template in your reactions? Is it like 50 nanograms, 20, 10? That's a wonderful question. Again, this is to do with a copy number. Okay. Um, so we've been able to identify up to 0 0.05 nanograms of template. Uh, and uh, in fact, lower than that, but if you talk in terms of copy number, uh, then let's say for COVID, we were able to get copy number of up to 50. Uh, from 50 to 100, we are easily, above 50, we are able to do. Uh, we are able to do between 10 and 100 when we did the applications with pneumonia and uh, uh, tuberculosis both. Uh, the only thing is between 10 to 50, there is variation in the results. So we are not consistently getting between 10 and 50. But definitely, I can say that between 50 to 100 copy number, we are able to do get good uh, numbers both for our bacteria as well as viruses. Thank you. So it is uh, in the proprietary stage right now, but we would love to discuss more later. Uh -huh. 
Yes, absolutely. I mean, interestingly, we developed a mycoplasma. So we, when we were just starting out and we didn't have enough samples, we collaborated with some uh, poultry farms and got some mycoplasma samples from them because for them that's a disease. So we actually developed a kit for them and de uh, detected mycoplasma. So anything, any bacteria, virus, fungi, anything with a genetic signature, any mutation, uh, any, uh, you know, uh, thing we can de definitely detect because it's based on the same, uh, you know, principles of PCR and RT-PCR, essentially. What is the likelihood ratio of this test? Uh, likelihood ratio, I'm sorry, I'm not aware what, what, in what context. You have given um, n n positive predictive value, negative predictive value, sensitivity specific. Yes. Like likelihood ratio is one of the component uh, to mm -hmm. to uh, understand about the how accurate the test is. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not aware of that particular term. Maybe I'll get back to you for sure. Yes, I'll find out and I'll get back to you. Thank you. Dr. Divya, the wonderful talk. Thank you so and much. We'll collaborate with you on in, immediately. We can do with uh, tuberculosis. Yes, ma'am. I'm so thank thankful to all of you for listening to me. Thank you so much.